Welcome to Life Transformation, a weekly podcast from Sunrise Church in Surrey, British Columbia. Stay tuned to hear inspiring messages and teachings, giving you hope and purpose, leading you to a life-changing relationship with Jesus as you follow Him. Uh, If I haven't met you, I'm Pastor Chris. I hope to meet you along the way. Uh, We're in the book of Revelation, so if you have your Bible, please turn to Revelation 8. And uh, we've got a lot to cover today. We've got a lot to cover today. So if I'm talking too fast for you, watch it back on Facebook, and there's an app online you can slow it down, okay? Because there's a lot to cover today, because uh, as I said earlier, I've been a bit behind uh, kind of our schedule, and uh, Pastor Braden and I met, and he said there's no other way to do it other than you preaching from chapter 8 to chapter 11 today. Okay, so are you ready for this? It's going to be a bit of a fire hose, and I don't apologize. Let me pray first. God, thank you for this day. Thank you that, Lord, you love people. Thank you, Lord, that you love nations. Thank you, Lord, that you are a just God as well. Thank you, Father, that as we come to your word, you can open it up to us, and you can have our minds understand it and our hearts embrace it, and we can be changed in the process. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone sit. Amen. If you're unfamiliar with the Bible, the Bible is divided into two primary sections. The Old Testament, dealing primarily with the history of the people of Israel, and the New Testament, dealing with the early church and what we read since Jesus came. We're going to be in the book of Revelation. And as we come to the book of Revelation, we've been trying to remind you this week to week to week. This is the revelation of Jesus by Jesus, about Jesus. So when we come to the book of Revelation, we're not trying to concentrate as much on the symbols and things we see there as what Jesus is doing there and looking for him. Why? Because the apocalypse or the revelation of Jesus means the unveiling, and it is titled the unveiling or the apocalypse of Jesus, not the challenging things that we might think are to come. So we're going to get into it, and we're going to read a big portion of scripture today. So stay with me. And I'm going to call, ask you to stand halfway through so you stay with me. Are you with me? Yes. Amen. Thank you. I know, Ike, I know you're with me. You're just, you don't need caffeine. You had the Holy Spirit this morning. So let's go. When we hit chapter 9, that's your cue to stand. And then you can sit down when we get to chapter 11, okay? okay. I'm, I'm going to let you do that at home too, or in your car, wherever you're, wherever you're doing it. <laughs> chapter 8. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and the seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God and from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it on the earth, and there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightnings, and an earthquake. Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. The first angel blew, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood, and there was, they were thrown upon the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the grass, the green grass was burned up. And the second trumpet, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed, and a third blew the trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers, and the on the springs of water, and the name of the star is Wormwood, and the third of the waters became like Wormwood, and many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. And the fourth angel blew his trumpet, and the third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, and a third of their light might be darkened, that a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. And then I looked, and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead, Woe! Woe! Woe to those who dwell on the earth. Remember that phrase, dwell on the earth. At the blasts of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet. Hey, someone's with us. Stand with us. We'll keep you, we'll keep you going here. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet. And I saw a great star fallen from heaven to earth. And he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. Remember that word, given. And he opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft smoke rose like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. And from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given, given power, like the power of scorpions on the earth. And they were told not to harm the grass or the earth or any green plants 
or any tree, but only people who do not have the seal of God on their forehead. We read about the seal of God in Revelation 7. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And the torment was like the torment of scorpions who sting someone. And in those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. In the appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for the battle. And on their heads, what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces and their hair like woman's hair and their teeth like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates like breastplates of righteousness. And the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. They have tails that sting like scorpions, and their power to hurt people for five months is in their tails. They have, as king over them, the angel from the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is abandoned, and in Greek he is called Apollyon. The first woe is past. Behold, two woes are still to come. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard the voice of the four, a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God, saying the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels have been prepared for that hour, that day, that month, and that year, were released to kill a third of mankind. And a number of the mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. And this is how I saw the horses in my vision and those who rode them. There were breastplates the color of fire and of sapphire and of sulfur, and their heads of their horses were like lion's heads, and fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. By these three plagues, a third of the mankind was killed by the fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths, for the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents with heads, and by means of them they wound. It's a lot already, okay? You still with me? Yeah. Whew. <laughs> Serious, Pastor Chris. What are you doing to us? The rest of, it's going to get good, okay? I know the end, I read it. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons or idols of gold and silver and bronze or stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk, nor do they repent of their murders, their sorceries, their sexual immoralities, or their thefts. Chapter 10, then I saw another mighty angel. Someone say mighty with me. Mighty. Mighty. Coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head. His face was like sun. His legs were like pillars of fire. He had a little scroll open in his hand, and he set one foot on the sea. Say that with me. And his left foot on the land. And he called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. Sound familiar? He called out that the seven thunders sounded. He called out, the seven thunders sounded. And when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, earth and what is in it, sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay, but that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled. Dun, dun, dun. Just as he announced to his servants and his prophets, then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me saying, go and take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the So I went to the angel and, and told him to give me a little scroll. And he said to me, take and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth, it's sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and I ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, My stomach was made bitter, and I was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, you can sit down for the last portion of the scripture. You say amen to that. (laughs) Thank you, Jesus. He's almost done. And then I get to preach. Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff. And I was told, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there, but do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations. They will trample the holy city for 42 months, and I will grant authority for my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouths and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. For they have the power to shut the sky that no man may fall during the days of their prophesying. They have the power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the streets of the great city that is symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt where the Lord was crucified. Three and a half days, some of the peoples of the tribes of languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies refusing to put them in a tomb, and they will make merry and exchange presents because the two prophets that have tormented those who dwell on the earth. Remember that phrase. But after three and a half days, the breath of 
life of God, sorry, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood up on their feet, and with great fear fell on those who saw them. And when they heard, then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying, come up here, and they went up heaven in cloud, and their enemies watched them. And at that hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified, and they gave glory to the God of heaven. Pay attention to that. They gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is soon to come. The last few scriptures as we read. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices saying, The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones, they fell on their faces before him, worshiping, saying, We give thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty, who was, sorry, who is and was. For you have taken your great power, you have began to reign, the nations raged, but your wrath came, and from the time for the dead to be judged, and for the rewarding of your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and for those who fear your name, both great and small, and the destroying, the destroyers of the earth. And when God's, then God's temple in heaven was opened, I saw the Ark of the Covenant was seen within his temple, and there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. And someone say, Amen. He, I've never read that much scripture in one time in a sermon, and I do not apologize because we're going to get through it all today, okay? I'm going to give you as much as I can in the time we have so that we can continue on. I want to say one thing as we come to this. It's complicated. Someone say that. Okay, good. The amen section is saying it's complicated. If you look at Revelation 8, 5, turn back there, if you will, and keep your finger on Revelation uh, eleven nineteen. You'll find the reason why I decided to preach this all together. This is the seven trumpets all together. Revelation 8, 5, after the angel takes from the throne the censer and he uh, throws it down on the earth, we see rumblings, peals of thunder. We see an earthquake. At the end, in eleven nineteen, we see the same thing happen. Peals of thunder, rumblings, and an earthquake, all symbolic of the wrath and judgment of God that is getting poured out. And this is the bookends of the seven trumpets. The seven trumpets first start with the last of the six seals, if you've been following with us. And as we read these things, we have to understand, first context is always early church and the Roman Empire. So what's happening? It's happening to the early church and happening to the Roman Empire. And secondly, it's happening to those who oppose the Lamb all through history and his kingdom. This is apocalyptic literature. This book has three types of genres. Epistle, because it's written to churches. Apocalyptic, which generates the ideas and images in our head that they didn't have access to. They could not just Google the four horsemen or the seven trumpets. They couldn't Google that, so it's designed to inspire the imagination. And thirdly, there is prophetic things. Right now, we're in a big portion of narrative, apocalyptic, symbolic language. And I want to remind you of this. Everything you're seeing now in the book of Revelation has to go back to Revelation 4 and 5 where the lamb is being worshipped. Where he is there being worshipped and he is worthy to take the scroll and to start to open that scroll by breaking the seals. And he gets to the sixth seal and that's where we started with the first trumpet. Everything is on the background of the fact that the lamb is worthy and he gets worshipped and therefore the lamb is working in his world. Now, when I read this, I kind of go, I wish I didn't have to preach this. In fact, most preachers will end at Revelation 5 and pick up at like 21. True. It's like what what we do. But we're going to get to the big stuff in the middle because we have to handle it. It's all God's word for us today. And when we look at this today, we have to understand that what God works out in his world is actually his plan. Sometimes we look and go, I don't like that. I don't like things like hail and fire and who, these guys are consuming people. With, I don't like that. This is God's word. And as we approach it, we need to kind of humble ourselves and come underneath it. I'll just say one thing. There was a, there was a notable um, author at one time. He's, he's not very notable anymore, but he said, he would say things like, what kind of God would be a God of judgment? What kind of God would, would be praised for his judgment? The kind of God that we read about in Revelation 11. Because he's just, he brings judgment. Because he's a good God, a loving God, he knows that he's not going to let everything happen in this world without bringing justice and judgment. So let me make a first few comments. If you flip over to Revelation 7.14, I want to just define a couple things for you as we get into this. Um, Revelation 7.14, it talks about those who came out of the great tribulation. Now, I mentioned last week, this is in the Greek, it's a noun. It's not a proper noun, not deserving to be capitalized. In fact, in one of the early versions of the King James Version, it was capitalized in error. 
This is not speaking about a time frame. This is the same word, philipsis in the Greek, that we read in Revelation 1.9, where John says, I'm your partner and brother in the philipsis, the tribulation. This is the same thing that we read to the church of Smyrna. He says, philipsis to them. He says, I know your philipsis. I know your tribulation. I know what you're going through. We're not told in the book of Revelation that this is a time period with a start and an end. And if you've been taught that, that's okay. But the book of Revelation does not teach that. It, we have to let the text do justice to itself. That word philipsis, you're also going to read 2 Corinthians 1. Blessed be the God of all comfort who comforts us in our philipsis. He comforts us in our affliction and tribulation. In fact, Jesus himself said this, and you might remember this. In this world, you will have trouble. You will have philipsis, you will have suffering, you will have pressure, you will have oppression. But he said, take heart, I've overcome the world. Yeah. Revelation 7, 14, when it talks about a great tribulation, it does not teach that there's a time frame of it. It talks about the suffering that Christians will endure. This is not the wrath of God. This is not the judgment of God that we're reading in these chapters. Are you with me? If you follow him, you don't need to fear. If you follow Jesus, you don't need to fear. We need to know that we'll be in suffering. That is just natural. That happens in this world. We are pressing against the kingdom. That kingdom is on defense. Jesus' kingdom with the Lamb is on offense. Amen? Amen. As we get into Revelation 8, we see this, that the the sixth seal is the initiation of the seven trumpets. And, And what is all this stuff, this judgment, these trumpets being trumpeted, and all of a sudden there's death and pouring out, and there's a third of this and a third of that and a third of that. We have to understand this, that Revelation has questions and answers. And the question that started in the sixth seal in Revelation 6, the martyrs cry out, how long, O Lord, until you avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Martyrs were being killed. First century, currently even now, martyrs are being killed. The question was, how long until you do something, Lord? He starts answering it in that part of Revelation 6, where he shows the judgment on those who dwell on the earth. The kings, the rulers, the generals, all the high people. Everyone is facing the judgment. Everyone is facing some sort of wrath of God. And we have to understand that what we're going to hit here is the answer. Now, just give me a little excursus here on those who dwell on the earth, who I call the dotes, because in my notes I have to write it small so I can get through the sermon today, the D-O-T-E. Who are those who dwell on the earth? We'll have some notes behind. Those people who dwell on the earth in Revelation is a technical term, and if we can get that definition up there, It's those who oppose the kingdom of the Lamb and stand against his inbreaking kingdom. So when you read those who dwell on the earth, don't think, oh, that's me. No, no, no. You are one of the sealed servants that we've read about earlier. Those who dwell on the earth are those who are against the Lamb, those who are killing God's people, those who are pressing against the kingdom of the Lamb and standing against his inbreaking. That's who those who dwell on the earth are. Those who dwell on the earth are noted in Revelation 8.13 for having woe upon them because they are those who dwell on the earth. They are those in Revelation 13.8 who worship the beast. In Revelation 13.12 who are deceived by the beast. And in Revelation 7.18 they marvel at the beast because they want to worship everything that is a counterfeit image of Jesus Christ. Do not fear when you follow Jesus. You are not one of those in the book of Revelation that is dwelling on the earth, even though you might think, I do live on the earth. You are one of those, if you follow Jesus, who is sealed. And when you follow him, you don't have to fear. Are you with me today? Amen. Amen. So I said, this is the answer to the prayer, who can stand? If you follow me to Revelation 8, 3, there's this beautiful picture where the prayers of the saints are taken to the altar of heaven. And there's an angel there, and, and he basically scoops up within a censer. He, he grabs the censer full of the stuff from the altar, including the prayers of the saints. And the prayers of the saints, how long, Lord, until you change our world? How long until you do something? Have you ever prayed that prayer? Lord, do, Lord, do something? Like, Lord, don't you see what's happening? Do something! You're on your knees, you, you're, you're literally crying out, Lord, do something! You're in good company. Because the Lord hears that prayer. He always does. He might not answer the way you think he should answer. He might not always answer in your timing. But let me tell you this. The lamb is working. We don't always see it. He's working because he is worthy. How long? The beautiful thing is the angel 
has the permission to reveal what begins to happen. And he takes the things from the altar, including the prayers of the saints. How long, O Lord, until you avenge? Lord, won't you do something? God, don't you see what's happening in our world? And he takes it and he throws it down to the earth. And what happens? Peals of thunder, lightnings, rumbling, and an earthquake. He gets to reveal the very plan of God to bring judgment on this earth against those who dwell on the earth. You know what? It's kind of dark. It's gruesome. It's strange. But I'm comforted in the fact that God is hearing my prayer. Lord, do something. Lord, how long? God is the one who is just. That's why we see these judgments. And as we look at the scripture today, we don't, what do we, what do we even pull out of the scripture? Like, how do we apply this scripture? Like, hail, blood, fire, death, sea, ships. What do we do? We realize this, that this scripture calls us to be people of prayer interceding for the coming of the Lamb's kingdom and interceding for mercy upon those who need mercy. You know what mercy is? Mercy is, mercy is God withholding something you should have. Not a good thing. It's withholding a judgment or something that should be on you. He put everything on Jesus. That was mercy that you don't get all that judgment and all that wrath. So we need to pray, God, let your kingdom come. We need to pray, God, let mercy roll out. Bring people to you. I love that the only thing that causes silence in heaven is that an angel is dealing with the prayers of the saints. Wow, so good. Revelation 4 and 5, it's all worship. It doesn't stop day and night. That those, those creatures, day and night, it says, never ceasing. What, what causes it to stop? The prayers of the saints. The angel takes them and he does something. He is permitted as an angel, a servant of Jesus, to do something about it. And I want to remind you this. The people of God are always at war, okay? And you might go, well, that doesn't sound good. And, and Pastor Chris, you know I'm a pacifist. Like, I'm, I'm not a war-loving person. Let me just frame this for you. The book of Revelation, one of the motifs or the idea is that the holy people of God are in a holy war with the suffering slain lamb. We don't get victory by the political leader. We don't get victory by the religious leaders as symbolized in the beasts to come. We get victory by following the suffering slain lamb. That's our path to victory and we will be in battle doing it. It doesn't mean you have to be all like weird about your faith, okay? It does not mean you need to be an agitator of the the, uh, culture around us. It doesn't mean you need to oppose even the culture around us. It just means that you know we're in battle. Ephesians tells me this, that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, right? It says, I do not wrestle against flesh and blood. The victory is going to come by following the Lamb. We're, we're, We're fighting against principalities and powers and things in heavenly places. This is what we do. Now let's get into the trumpets because we got some time today and we still want to have some beautiful Caribbean and African food after this service. Holla! Come on now. You should try the pepper soup. It's really good. I had a little bit. I think Ike made it for me. It's like he tamed it down, but now he made it for him. I'm not going to have a lot of stories, so i got to put in a couple of jokes, okay? I'm just trying to get through it today. The trumpets, what do the trumpets do? They tie us to the Old Testament symbolically because in the Old Testament, trumpets meant the caution or the warning. That's what trumpets meant in the Old Testament. And in the first context of this, this is against Rome. We can't forget that the early church is oppressed by Rome and Domitian at this time around 95 or 96 AD. The second is, again, those who oppose the Lamb. So there's something happening to Rome. God took care of Rome. He caused Rome to be defeated and fall. And he is continually working against those who oppose the Lamb. So what we see is that There is judgment that comes. These trumpets hearken back to things in Joel and Ezekiel 33. But the judgment is not full. Do you notice it's one-third? 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 And I don't know if you're an optimist or a pessimist, but I read that, and even though I'm like an optimist, I go, oh, one-third, like, that's a lot. But then I realize, whoa, wait a second. There's still two-thirds left. God is still showing his mercy even in the judgments. And because I'm an optimist, if someone said, hey, here's my Coke Zero. I haven't finished it. It's probably my son because, you know, I'm not going to share with you right now because (laughs) it's jokes. And they said, there's like two-thirds left. I wouldn't throw it out and go, ah, I love myself some vitamin Z. (laughs) It's not full. We're going to see full later. But again, this is the first judgment that comes upon Rome and second on those who oppose the Lamb. You know, if you look around this world, I think we could all agree to this phrase, something is wrong. Yeah, Yeah? something is wrong online, something is wrong. One of my favorite uh, 
authors who went to be with Jesus last year, he's an author, Bible teacher, and Christian counselor, Larry Crabb. He said this in one of his books, and hear this. Something is wrong with everything. Something is wrong with everything. That means your relationships will not be perfect. Your job will not be perfect. Your church, hallelujah, will not be perfect. Neither will your pastor be perfect. There's something wrong with everything. Someone say amen. Amen. The kingdom has been inaugurated, but it's not consummated. When it's consummated, when Jesus returns from his second coming, then we will see everything is made right. Everything is made new. Something is wrong with everything. And here we see that this judgment gets poured out in seven trumpets. As I said earlier about the seals, there's four that look the same. There's two, then an interlude, and one. And the four, first four that we see there actually mimic the plagues of Egypt. You see blood, you see hail, you see all these things happening. There are things that are happening naturally to the earth that are mimicking the plagues of Egypt. And really what it is, when you look at those first four, it is literally nature going awry. It's nature in chaos, and God allows nature to be in chaos. Why? So he can draw people to himself somehow, some way, through what he's doing in that place. So when the plagues came on Egypt, Pharaoh did not repent. In fact, he hardened his heart. And even when he let the people go, he chased after them. There was option for Pharaoh to repent, and he did it the same with Revelation here. There's option for people to repent. He's not eliminating everyone. He's giving them option to repent. It says in chapter 9 that they didn't. So we see these four trumpets that mimic the plagues of Egypt, and and they're natural. Then we see these two trumpets that seem really demonic because they have uh, uh, this this, uh, angel coming from, this beast coming from, uh, this bottomless pit. We see a demonic picture of what's happening in this portion of Scripture. But I want to remind you of this, and I highlighted those words, given, given, given. What does given mean? If Jesus is giving someone the keys, if God is giving this angel to open this thing the keys, who's got the authority? Jesus does. Why? Because it says in Revelation, he holds the keys to death and Hades. He's going, guess what? Where's my key? Here's a key. It's just on loan. You're, just, you're, you're borrowing it. It is in your key. I'm going to call it back, and I'm going to hold it. Everything that happens in the next is under the authority and the sovereignty of Jesus. Don't miss that. And if you go back to a few chapters, it's on the worthiness of the Lamb. All of this is happening under sovereignty. When we follow him, you do not fear. Are you with me? It's under divine sovereignty. A star falls from heaven, and he's given the key. Jesus has the keys. Revelation 1.8 to death in Hades. And Jesus gives them on loan, and he's going to call them back. And all of a sudden, we see more shadows of the judgments against Egypt. We see locusts now. Locusts, what happened? That was a plague, the eighth plague in Egypt. We see the locusts come out. And they're harming those people. Pay attention to this in verse 4. Do not harm anyone except those who don't have the seal on their forehead. The seal of God on their forehead, that is the symbol for those who are his servants, those who are his followers. The the number that we see later is counterfeit of what God has done. He first seals his servants, then the enemy wants to do what? Counterfeit something on those who don't follow him. So even here, we see that those who follow the Lamb... In his suffering, they will be under thalipsis, but they are not getting this judgment poured out on them. We are protected, and when we follow him, we do not need to fear. Talks about the king over them, the angel from the bottomless pit. Destruction is the name. And again, first century, they read this, and they they see it in Rome. They see destruction. they, They see the oppression. They see the killing. They see the murdering. They see all of that. First century, they're understanding this is about the war that the empire has on people, and this is about the war that the people who follow the Lamb make on the empire. Historically, if you study the history behind it, uh, most people believe that's prophetic, actually, about the fall of Rome by the barbarians that came, the hordes that came and caused the fall of Rome. That's another six-hour conversation with me. And I'm trying to give you about 10 hours of content in 35 minutes, so bear with me. How you doing? Are you still with me? (laughs) <laughs> Ike, you, got, Ike and you guys are the worship team. You've got to be with us because you've got to be here for a second service. <laughs> okay, there's so much to cover here. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. 
You see, we saw the seals be opened up. Four horsemen, martyrs, and then some judgment. And the seventh seal is the trumpets. The seals have a perspective to them, and the trumpets have a perspective. And the seals have this perspective of what's happening from the perspective of the church. The church is crying out, how long? And judgment's happening. What, what are those who know this is going to come? In Revelation 6, at the end, they say, who can stand? Hide us from the face of the Lamb. And as these trumpets come, this is from the perspective of those who dwell on the earth who are crying out for mercy and who are facing judgment. The challenge when we get to the scripture is we look at the four and the two and the one. The challenge when we see these pictures of judgment is we love to do this. Well, this, this here is that today. Well, this here was that in 19. 19- 42. This here was that in, in 1917. This here was that. And though it might look like that, we cannot impose that onto our history and our scripture. That's where it gets really dangerous. We can't do that. Because then all of a sudden, you're, you're saying scripture says that person. And this is uh, apocalyptic in nature. And this part is not necessarily prophetic. It's not trying to tell you what's happening in this day and that time with that person. So be very careful when you start doing that. You go, well, this thing here, that must be that. In fact, there's been people at time who said, well, obviously these locusts, this was, this was about the battle uh, in the Gulf. That's what it was. That was the helicopters. It was definitely the helicopters. No, John doesn't tell us that. He, he tells us what he sees and what he hears is like this. He's trying to describe it to you so we have some sort of understanding for the first century. When I look at this judgment that gets poured out, I really think it, it starts to hint towards this. In our world, how long will our world ignore God's ways? How long will we assume that we know the best for ourselves? As Christians, how long will we think we're the ones in authority and control? School shootings? Genocides? Brokenness? Murders? Regimes that deal in blood and terror? People who want what they want and don't care who they run over? How long will we ignore God's ways and continue to see this stuff happen? Every time I look at that, I get saddened because I go, this is what happens when we don't follow the Lamb. The world goes into chaos. And people follow their own chaos. And the enemy loves to come alongside them and say, yeah, you do that. You destroy those people. You break that marriage up. You fight against each other. You try to get your own way. He just tries to encourage the flesh and get us to do exactly what the flesh is designed to do. Read it in Galatians 5. We don't need the enemy to tell us how to behave badly. Our flesh will do it itself. The enemy just comes and says, you can't do it. You do it. I'm going to help you. The devil made me drunk. No, your flesh will want you to, make, will want you to be drunk. The enemy just agrees with you and says, go and do it. Right? Go on and do it. How long will we ignore God's ways? This is a call to repent. For the world, but also for us. In Revelation 9, it says, they did not repent of their ways. They did not repent of their idols who do not speak and cannot hear. They didn't repent of their sexual immoralities. They didn't repent. This is those who dwell on the earth. They're not repenting, but it calls us to make our life right with Jesus. And church, for us to walk in humility and repentance is to put ourselves before God and say, Lord... In myself, I'm not and will never be enough. And if you think you don't have anything to repent of, the first thing to repent of is independence and pride. Okay? When I find myself and I'm praying, and I'm like, Lord, would you reveal sin into my life and I don't think of anything right away? The first place I start, Lord, expose my pride. Lord, expose my independent spirit. God's intent is for all people on the earth to actually repent. But he's so sovereign and so powerful that he's not above letting his earth and people be exposed to judgment and pain to try everything to get them to repent. Well, if I was God, I wouldn't do that. Well, if I was God, I wouldn't make it that way. Thank God that we're not God. (laughs) Come on now. If I was God, man, that driver that was in front of me, zap, bang, gone. (laughs) Just like, 
Can we be honest for a second? If we were God, it wouldn't be so good, right? Who's the last person that ticked you off? And you're like, oh, pastor, no one ever ticks me off. Come on. Like, let's be honest, okay? Someone probably annoyed you in service today. If you had your druthers, you'd be like, what is that? Call down fire. He wants us to repent. Revelation 6, at the end of the last seal, it says, who will hide us from the face of the Lamb who sits on the throne and from the great day of his wrath? The people who dwell on the earth want to run from his face. The people who follow him want to run to his face. Remember the story of the prodigal son? He does his own thing, lives his own life, and then all of a sudden comes to his senses. He says, Isn't it better in my father's house? Isn't it better to be a servant in my father's house than to live this life? You see, the father's waiting for people to turn back to him, and he's using everything at his disposal to do that. We're supposed to run to him. Chapter 10, we, we meet the mighty angels. Someone say, mighty. 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 Say it like you mean it. Mighty. mighty. There we go. Thank you, Jesus. I, just, I really just want to keep you with me, because this is a lot to go through. And we're going to land. We're going to worship at the end. We're going to have some food. It's going to be good times. And I pray the sun is still out after this. Here you got this mighty angel that comes down. He's got a little scroll in his hand. What do you see? He's, he's got a cloud around him. Why? It symbolizes Exodus, the cloud that God dwells in his presence. And all of a sudden, he's got a rainbow over his head. What does that symbolize? The rainbow over the throne, Revelation 4, 3. It's all these pictures of this angel being the messenger of Christ. And he's coming to bring a message. And as he brings this message... He swears by the one who lives forever and ever. And he talks about the mystery being revealed. This is anticipatory. It's the interlude. It's the break. There's four and then two and a break and then seven. That's how it works. In the seals, there's four and then two and a break and then the seventh, which is the start of the trumpets. Four, two, break, seven. This is the interlude. As if all that judgment is done. And you read it and you go, whew, wow, that's awesome. I think the first readers or first hearers would have had this read to them. They're like, oh, good. An angel is coming, and it's, it looks like what was in Revelation 1. It looks like this could be just like Jesus, a messenger from God. It's not done yet. But here I want you to notice this. I called out two things where the angel is standing. He's standing on the sea and on the, as Christ's representative. Later on, where did the beasts come from? Who's sovereign over the sea and the land? Jesus is. It's his creation. The angel is literally standing on sea and land, symbolically doing this very thing, that even if a beast comes up, guess what? Christ's representative, mighty angel, who looks like him, is standing on the sea and the land. Feet on each. When you follow Jesus, you don't have to fear. Don't fear. Don't fear. In chapter 10, as we get through this picture of what John is told to seal up and not say. He takes it, he eats it, sweet in his mouth, bitter in his stomach, harkens back to Jeremiah. And then we see this thing is told him in verse 11 of chapter 10. I was told you must again prophesy about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. The judgments that got poured out were not enough to make people turn and repent. It says, in fact, they didn't repent. So what do we learn from here? We learn that John has a task to continue to prophesy and speak to nations and peoples and languages and kings about the coming of Jesus and about his plan. So church, what's our call? To, like John, be people who announce, who prophesy, who pray, God has come and he's coming. And guess what? He loves you. He wants to seal you and spare you from any judgment and any wrath. That's what he wants to do. God is coming with the priority of heaven to ransom, rescue, and redeem nations, tribes, peoples, everyone. That's his plan. And what's our call? Not only is it firstly to pray and intercede for the Lord to come and for mercy on those. Not only is it for us to repent and make our hearts right, but it is to announce, to prophesy and pray that the Lord is coming and the Lord has come. The church, our mission is to share Jesus. The trumpets weren't enough, so John has to prophesy. Guess what? 
judgment against people, and even the fear that that can produce in their lives is not enough to cause them to turn. We have to preach the love and grace of Jesus. Are you with me? But church, don't hold out the fact that God is a God of justice. I, I've been alive on this earth for like 45 years, plus the womb, you know, lots of time. I've been a pastor for like 20 plus years. Do you know what I hear most frustrations from people? Why isn't it different? Why did that breakup hurt me? Why is my family estranged? Why is there such brokenness? It's the cry for justice in our hearts. We, we love to have the loving God, but we don't like to think about judgments and justice, yet in our hardest moments, the cry is for justice. And it might not be like, Lord, hurt them back. No, 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 that's not. It's, Lord, why? It's a cry for justice. And all of a sudden, we hit chapter 11 here. And John's given this rod to measure the temple and all who are there and within it. And he's told, don't measure the outer court. It's going to be turned over to the nations for it to be trampled. Then we meet these two witnesses. What's, what's, what's here in view? Who's the temple in the New Testament? It is the believers, those who follow Jesus. They are the temple. God has given you a temple. You're to steward the temple. Christ said he would tear down the temple, and at this time the temple has been torn down 26, 25, 26 years after that. Why? Why does he measure the temple? Now remember, symbols, not statistics. Symbols, not statistics. When he measures something, this prophetic picture that we see out of Zechariah 2, He's measuring to protect the people who are within the presence of God. You are protected. I'm measuring around you. I'm keeping a boundary around you. When you are following Jesus, you are protected. But remember this, that these two witnesses that we read here, which seems crazy, there's fire and plagues and consuming people, and then they die. The prophetic picture we see here, this is literally Elijah and Moses. It's the picture of them. Because what did Moses do? He brought the law. What did Elijah do? He was one of the prophets. There's this tension between the law and the prophets, the already that is here and the not yet that will come. And their words of the prophets are there to not harm followers. It's to torment those who dwell on the earth, to try to draw them to Jesus. This is one of the things that Jesus uses. But he protects his people since the followers of Jesus who do not fear him are protected in his presence. What about the outer courts? Those are those who, who if they do not follow him, will have judgment on them. Those are people who oppose the lamb. 42 months, symbol, not a statistic. Why is it symbolic? Do you remember how many generations there was from Adam to Jesus? 42, 14, 14, 14. Symbol, symbol, symbols, okay? If you try to get statistics, you're gonna get super confused and you're gonna go, well, that one is and that one isn't and that one is and that one isn't. Symbols, not statistics as we approach the book of Revelation. Elijah was told that the heavens were shut up and he prayed that they'd be open. Elijah, in his encounters as a prophet, saw fire working, same as the first witness. Moses was the lawgiver, the one who had permission to see the plagues on Egypt, the very same thing that we see here. And, and they get killed symbolically in the place called Sodom and Egypt. Sodom, which is representing human corruption. Egypt, which is representing the oppression. This is the place or the people who are resisting the lamb. Why do the two witnesses die? Do you notice that they get resurrected again? Does that remind you of anything in the Bible? After a certain amount of time, breath comes back into somebody. There was the bones, then there was Jesus, then all the other people who got resurrected. Why did they die? Well, there's, there's this moment, there's this time when the people who are enemies of Jesus and enemies of the witness think they have victory. They believe for a short time there's victory because the two witnesses who are tormenting us are now dead and says they exchange gifts, they make merry because they're dead. And all of a sudden, Jesus does something and he resurrects them and he says, come up here. You know what? When Jesus was on the cross, his enemies thought they had victory for a moment. They thought they had victory when he uttered his last words. Into your hands I commit my spirit. It is finished. They thought it was finished. They thought they had victory, but guess what? God wasn't done. The picture here is the prophetic picture that they thought they had victory. God wasn't done. Side note here, before I finish. And worship team, you can get ready to come up in 38 seconds. When does this happen? 
When did the trumpets all happen? There's three kind of main theological positions. And I think I might even have them on here. Yeah. When? After Jesus' second coming. Along with Jesus' second coming or before Jesus' second coming. If it's after Jesus' second coming when he returns, the challenge is is that only one-third of the earth has faced judgment. It's partial. It's not full. If it's along with his coming, when he comes in his second coming, again, the same thing. We only see one-third. So we have to say, okay, God, when are you going to release this? Worship team, you can come up and get ready. You can chat with me about this. Send me a text or an email or book some time with me. I believe it's actually before Jesus returns. Why do I believe that? Because his judgments are being worked out on the stage of history all the time. His judgments have been against nations and kingdoms and regimes and reigns. He's working that out at all time through the acts that Jesus does on the stage of history. And in this book, first against Rome, second against those who oppose Jesus is working out his wrath and judgments against people. And when he comes, when we see him face to face, his second coming, when we see him, this is when he unfolds the rest and he makes all things new. You might not be with me. You don't have to believe what I believe. But at least consider what God is doing in this time. Here's what happens in the end of this portion of Scripture. That as the seventh seal is open and they announce the kingdom of God is now the kingdom of this world, we see this prophetic picture that something's happening. Revelation 12, we're going to see it soon in a few weeks. We're going to see the prophetic picture that is there of Jesus coming as a child, the Messiah coming to earth and inaugurating his kingdom on earth. This is what's happening, the mystery being revealed that he spoke to his prophets and his servants. What happens is God gets praised for his just and good judgments. God gets praised for his just and good judgments. Hear this with me. The 24 elders who sit on the thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped. Can I get some keys? Can I get some anointed music in the background? We give thanks to you. Lord God Almighty, we give thanks to you who is and who was for you have taken your great power and you've begun to reign. Can you bring that down a bit, Austin, please? Thanks. The nations raged, but your wrath came. And the time for the dead to be judged and the rewarding your servants and prophets and saints and those who fear your name, both great and small, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. God gets praised even for his just judgments. So church, this whole scripture, these these four chapters are this. For us, it's a call to prayer. To be people who intercede for the kingdom to come and for mercy on those who are pictured as those who dwell on the earth. It's a call for us to repent. Do you know what will lead the world into repentance? Us getting our hearts right first. The church owning what it needs to own. You and me owning what we need to own. We're called to repent. And then we're called to announce and prophesy, pray and preach and tell people, God has come in Jesus and he is coming and he's got a plan for you. He wants to seal you. And it's a call for us to worship because his judgments are just. Because a true and loving God does not just pass over wrong, does not just look and turn his eye towards injustice. A loving God who is holy looks at those things and says, I am working. If you follow me, fear not. And today, maybe you've never taken a step towards Jesus. And even today, this sermon might confuse you. Confuses me. Let me tell you this. Jesus came to show you his love and to provide a way to have a relationship with God. And today, you can take a step towards Jesus and his love and grace and calling for you. And if you want to take a step, I want to pray a prayer. And today, I'm going to ask everyone if you would stand and ask everyone if they'd bow their head. We're going to pray a prayer which simply is about committing your life to Jesus and becoming a follower of him. And followers of him do not have to fear. Simply pray like this. Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. That he came to give me a way to God. 
that he came to forgive all of my brokenness, wash all my pain away, and deal with sin, that the Bible says. Today I want to follow you. I want to surrender my life to you. Make me brand new. I turn my life to follow you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can lift your heads. If you prayed that prayer today for your first time, that's what we would call becoming a Christian. You made a confession with your mouth and you're believing with your heart that Jesus is the way to God and that he rose again for you. We have a book we want to put in your hand. It's called the Start Here book. You can get it at the Connect Center. We want to put that in your hand. And we want you to begin following Jesus in three simple ways you do that. Read a Bible. We've got one out there for you. Tell someone you became a Christian. Amen. Tell someone. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then keep attending church. Amen. We're going to worship. What I love about this song we're going to worship too is it's a picture of all tribes and tongues singing and worshiping when we get to that portion. So let's worship. Because even the justice of God and the judgments of God, he's still worthy to be worshipped. Yes. Let's worship. You've just been listening to Life Transformation, a weekly podcast of life-changing messages, giving you hope and purpose. If you would like prayer or more resources to a better you, connect with us on our website, sunrise.ca, or follow us on Instagram at sunrisechurchbc.com.